Dear friends, welcome to e Shala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Identity Politics, Insiders and Outsiders, which is part of the Political Sociology paper. How do we define identity? Is identity absolute or is it relative? What are the different kinds of identities a person can have? Could they be multiple simultaneously? These are some of the questions that are going to be addressed in this module. Further, this module will also try and theorize the question of identity through both a phenomenological and a structural kind of understanding of how an individual comes to possess an identity and how this identity becomes the hallmark for that individual to interact and socialize in life worlds that he or she is located in. Defining identity. Identity as it exists in the present form is at once a social and cultural phenomenon. It emerges from the consciousness that arises in an individual or a group who realize there is a threat that surrounds their existence on a given social premise. Identity, as Harvey notes in Spaces of Hope, cannot be understood outside of forces that swirl around it and construct an identity emerges for each of us only out of efforts at control amid contingencies and contentions in interaction. Human interaction are complex phenomena to understand and comprehend. Thus, identity is at once an inclusive and an exclusionary phenomena. It includes all those who fall under the ambit of a realization and others who don't belong will either stay out of the ambit or make their own identity. These efforts need not have anything to do with the domination over others' identities. Rather, it's about finding a clear footing among other identities. Such footing is a position that entails a stance, brings orientation in relation to other identities. An identity is the set of meaning that define who one is when one is an occupant of a particular role in society, a member of a particular group or claims particular characteristics that identify him or her as a unique person. As Stryker points out, identities provide accounts for and of themselves. Identity has varied meaning and different connotations. For the sake of simplistic understanding, three broad categorizations of identity are discussed below. The first view of identity refers to the cultural or collective view of identity in which the concept represents the ideas, beliefs and practices of a group or collective. This view of identity is often seen in work or on ethnic identity. Although identity is not defined, thus obscuring what is gained by using the concept. This view lacks the ability to examine individual variability in behavior, motivation and interaction. The second view of identity grows out of the work of social identity theorists like Tachfell and others see identity as embedded in a social group or category. This view often collapses the group or category distinction and misses the importance of which group behavior such as role relationship among other groups. The third view of identity grows out of the symbolic interactionist tradition, especially its structural variant. This view takes into account individual role relationships and identity, variability, motivation and differentiation. What the following views of identity theory have in common is a general set of principles that has enumerated as underlying the structural symbolic interaction perspective. According to Stryker, these include certain specifications. That behavior is dependent upon a named or classified world and that these names carry meanings in the form of shared responses and behavioral expectations that grow out of social interaction. That among the named classes are symbols that are used to designate positions in the social structure. That persons who act in the context of given three, that persons who act in the context of social structure name one another in the sense of rec recognizing one another as occupants of position and come to have expectations for those others. 
that persons acting in the context of social structure also name themselves and create internalized meanings and expectations with regard to their own behavior. That these expectations and meanings form the guiding basis for social behavior and along with the probing interchanges among actors shape and reshape the content of interaction as well as the categories, names and meanings that are used. The negotiated meaning that emerges from this social interaction is the shared component in these views of identity theory. Yet, despite the widespread assumption that it is the substance of identity rather than the word identity that is problematic, identity still remains demonstrably a complicated word. Varied dimensions of identity. While the notion of identity is not new, especially as a socio-political arena, a widespread concern with one's personal identity and its relation to the others among whom one lives seems to have emerged with greater intensity with the Enlightenment and to gain force throughout the 19th and 20th century into our own time. George Herbert Mead's view for identity as dependent upon the recognition of others and thus brought further nuances into the notion of identity. Mead argued that human identities develop out of a three-way conversion between I, me and generalized other. It is by taking the attitude of the other that we learn reflexively to monitor our identities and present them to others. Thus, identities are formed out of the constant ebb and flow of conversation between ourselves and others. Charles Taylor, on the other hand, argues that the modern identity is characterized by an emphasis on its inner voice and capacity for authenticity, that is, the ability to find a way of being that is somehow true to oneself. While doctrines of equality stress the notion that each human being is capable of deploying his or her practical reason or moral sense to live an authentic life as an individual, the politics of difference has appropriated the language of authenticity to describe ways of living that are true to the identities of marginalized social groups. Brubaker and Cooper have recently tried to bring some order to this concept by identifying five dominant ways in which the concept of identity is currently used in social science and the identity as ideology in humanities. A. Identity as a non-instrumental form of social action. B. Identities as a collective phenomenon of group sameness. C. Identities as deep and foundational forms of selfhood. D. Identities as interactive, contingent products of social action. And E. Identities as fluctuating, unstable and fragmented modes of the self. They argue that these five understandings of identity range from strong to weak uses of the concept. While the first two conceptions operate with the common sense hard uses of the term, the remaining three which are often found in the social constructivist approaches, particularly in cultural studies, anthropology and sociology, work with very soft, flexible and contingent understanding of identity. From this brief examination of how identity politics fits into the political landscape, it is already clear that the use of the term identity raises a host of philosophical questions. Logical use aside, it is likely familiar to philosophers from the literature in metaphysics on personal identities, one's sense of self and its persistence, indeed underlying many of the more overtly pragmatic debate about the merits of identity politics are philosophical questions about the nature of subjectivity, the self. The self is in constant interaction with society and hence it is argued that society or community is responsible for the othering and thus giving birth to identity. If all identity is produced in the context of community, many have sought to look at the way society seeks to regulate and manage its production. Many have sought to criticize Mead's views for neglecting the role of power and culture, helping shape identity, both of which is in the hands of the state in the Althusserian sense. 
The modern state apparatus has been involved in the regulation and monitoring of identity through a number of institutions, from prisons to the courts and from the education system to civil society. These new modes of control and surveillance are related to the rise of identity politics over the course of the 20th century. In opposition to the way in which many of the dominant features of modern societies have sought to police and control identities, many have used claims identity as a means of organizing themselves politically. Identity politics and overview. The familiar narrative of identity politics tells us that identity politics emerged suddenly onto the political scene in the late 1960s, challenging both the older politics of class and the organization of society in ways which systematically favored some groups on account of their identities and stigmatized and disenfranchised others. The main problem with this narrative is the identity politics have only a shallow history in the civil rights and freedom movements of the 1960s. This perspective has been challenged and contended by a number of historians of identity who have uncovered a far deeper history of identity politics, tracing its motivation and aim to the 19th century if not earlier. Nicholson in particular provides a particularly strong example of this revision. In Identity Before Identity Politics, she explores the ideational prehistory of identity politics and argues that though the movements themselves were not new, their aims and emphasis shifted during the 1960s, focus directly on identity issues. She opens her story of identity politics with the following passage, quote, During the late 1960s, certain political phenomena appeared on the U.S. landscape that altered the terms of the debate about social justice. The political movement on behalf of African Americans and women took a distinctive turn. Both of these movements had been a force in United States politics prior to the late 1960s, most visibly in the earlier civil rights and women's rights movement. In these earlier incarnations, these movements had fought for legislation aimed at expanding the access black people and women had to opportunities long denied to them for reasons of race and sex. But in the late 1960s, a new kind of emphasis emerged within the movement. While many within these movements continued to work for the above goals and others, particularly those who were younger and angrier, began to articulate different kinds of aims. Those who started calling their movement black power instead of civil rights and women's liberation as distinct from women's rights created a politics that went beyond the issues of access and focused more explicitly on issues of identity than had their earlier movement. Other activists such as those who, were, who, those who replaced gay rights with gay liberation also made a similar kind of turn. The more explicit form a focus of these groups on issues of identity caused many to describe this new politics as identity politics." Unquote. The notion identity emerges from the notion of politics of difference. The binary is already set with those belonging to specific identity taking their claim and those who don't contest it just accept it in silence. Politics of difference is an argument against the essentialist belief that there is a fixed identity, instead promoting the celebration of multiple and diverse values within society as reflecting the nature of difference. The politics of difference concerns the fundamental question of political subjectivity. It makes way for the possibility of new theories regarding political identity and therefore the individual a new approach with respect to his or her participation in society. The second key claim is that this emergence of identity as significant social, political and everyday concept cannot be understood separately from the context in which it emerged. When we look closely at the context of the usage of the new term identity, we find that it emerged in two key spaces. Firstly, in new patterns of consumption, particularly those associated with individualism, lifestyles and distinction, where these in turn were underwritten by new popular psychological discourse of personal transformation and personal stability. And secondly, in a series of political shifts that responded to and shaped the political economy landscape of Western capitalist society as demands for universal redistribution were gradually displaced for an overarching demand for group-based recognition.
These contending perspectives throw a new light on the origins and differentiated goals of identity-based movement and thus paves way for new theorization. The scope of political movements that may be described as identity politics is broad. The examples used in the philosophical literature are predominantly of struggles within Western capitalist democracy, but indigenous right movements worldwide, nationalist projects or demands for regional self-determination use similar arguments. Caste-based movements in India to speak of the historical injustice done to them on more or less similar lines. Predictably, there is no straightforward criteria that makes a political struggle into an example of identity politics. Rather, the term signifies a loose collection of political projects, each undertaken by representatives of a collective memory and experience with a distinctively different social location that has hitherto been neglected, erased or suppressed. It is beyond the scope of this essay to offer historical or sociological surveys of the many different social movements that have that might have might be described as identity politics. Instead, the focus here is to provide an overview of the range of debate in the expansive social theory. Indeed, the naming of identity politics as problem did not occur until the early years of the post-war period, when rapid change, the growth of new subculture and pressures to assimilate into mainstream society made who or what we were a major preoccupation within both intellectual and popular culture. Not that older notion of class conflict disappeared entirely. However, although an implicit model of class struggle still informed much of the movement politics, issues of deprivation and oppression were redefined along new lines. Indicative of the shift from production to consumption in the economy, protests now focused less on the material relations of production than on the consumption-related issues of the social, political and cultural representation and power. The basic questions of movements during the first half of the 20th century like exploitation, equal rights and suffrage, etc. got a new way of articulation in the post-war year. The larger question of equal rights got into the ambit of group recognition and class arguments of the pre-war years found their way into the new discourse in a truncated manner. The issue of exploitation and humiliation was gradually subsumed under the problem of exclusion and questions of class power was supplanted by emphasis on other forms of power. To venture a more comprehensive definition, identity politics refers to a strategy whereby individuals define themselves through identification with or membership in groups or categories regarded as the source of distinct feelings experiences of marginalization and subordination. As Foucault rightly points out, quote, each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth, that is the types of so a discourse which it accepts and makes function as truth. The mechanisms and instances which enable one to distinguish true and false statements. The means by which each is sanctioned, the techniques and procedures accorded value in question of truth. The status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true. We cannot raise the banner of truth against our own regime. There is no common measure between the imposition of the one and those of the other. Each regime is identified entirely with its imposed truth. Although the recognition of cultural difference is usually seen as a source of self-liberation and collective emancipation, there is a darker side to identity politics which has received far less attention. Instead of OFA celebration of difference, many identity projects couched as they are in discourses that reify and often institutionalized by powerful structures of the modern state tend either to reinforce group-centric views of social reality or repro reproduce blinkered and discriminatory forms of domination. The rhetoric of identity often becomes a potent device for the ideological justification of political inequality. This has in turn led to counter-narrative of sorts within the movements, that is entrapment of the larger goals within the ever-narrowing boundaries of short-term political gains. The narrowness of the vision for this part is exhibited in the rigidity of the new structure. Thus, identity as a concept has not only acquired almost universal acceptance, it has also become a normative trade jacket. 
Today a person is expected and required to have an identity, even though there is profound popular disagreement on whether identities are essential or existential, primordial or constructed, singular or multiple. There is almost no dispute over the question of whether identities exist or not. It is assumed that identity constitutes an indispensable ingredient of every human being so that making the claim of not having or wanting an identity might be regarded as tantamount to treason. Recent debates While not all proponents of identity politics have gone beyond critique, grounded in the economic disparities that characterize capitalism, there are undoubtedly those who find that the ideological economic is no longer a productive type of social transformation. Chantal Mufe and Ernest Laclau in their recent work emphasized the importance of keeping in mind the universal values and goals without getting lost in the particular. For this purpose, the emphasis on the notion of radical pluralism that is at once a universal and a particular phenomenon. Laclau and Mufe outlined their idea about radical pluralism and democracy in India. Pluralism is radical only to the extent that each term of this plurality of identities finds within itself the principle of its own validity, without this having to be sought in a transcend or underlying positive grounds for the hierarchy of meaning of them all and the source and guarantee of their legitimacy. And this radical pluralism is democratic to the extent that the auto constituity of each one of the items of each one of its terms is the result of displacement of the egalitarian imagery. Identity formation then takes place at the conjuncture of external and internal contingent and necessary processes that interconnect and emerge within the specific historical co conditions that are in good measure not of our own making. It would be naive then to explore identity formation outside the complex web of social structural relations. In recent times, many writers have suggested that as we move from an industrial to a post-industrial society, traditional social identities such as class will decline in social significance. Clark and Lipset, for example, have posed the question, are classes dying? While in a book entitled The Deaths of Classes, Pakulski and Waters have penned what in effect is an obituary of the concept. If you look back, given its origins, in the new movements beginning in the late 1960s, the left's preoccupation with identity has centered controversially on what has become to be known as identity politics, term characterizing those movements in which membership in is opposed and marginalized group provide the basis for a, comedy, uh, for a common identity, for the making of the political claims. The debates about identity politics, however, have often obscured the larger social and cultural transformation behind the rise of these movements and, more importantly, the broad stabilization of identity res resulting from institutional and technological changes in the West. Though identity-based movements brought range of new issues into the forefront of politics, over time they have become entrapped in the localized narration and narrowed version of their goals. The modern state, for its part, has its fair share in dissecting these movements into distinct entities and thus keeping them away from becoming a force to reckon with. It has come to the point where speaking of any kind of universal values is viewed with suspicion. This has led to a rise of another kind of hegemony within these movements where a constant discourse of othering happens on a daily basis. A larger debate on the structural transformation of oppressive state machinery still abates answers because of lack of a unified response in political praxis. Most theorizations have got entangled in the cobweb of the above-mentioned paradigm and thus unable to articulate a clear counter-narrative that will go on to challenge the dominant hegemony of the state. What is needed is a critical theory that is grounded in a fuller recognition of how particular social structures and relations condition a diversity of social and historical experiences and generate concrete social spaces that give rise to social, political and cultural identities. In turn, these social spaces are themselves productive sites, enabling the construction of new and potentially radical transformative political subjects. Thus. To conclude, we have seen in this module how the whole question of identity is theorized. 
and the whole idea of insider and outsider is a very relative one. Just as Benedict Anderson talks about an imagined community, this is exactly the way we understand how we belong to particular identities such as class, caste, religion, ethnicity, linguistic groups, etc. This belongingness is what is most important and it draws boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. It is through these boundaries and through gatekeeping that the politics of the insiders and outsiders takes place. Thank you.